that is only a sign of Allah and a lack of ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a weak ambition for the other. It's a sign of Allah. If you knew Allah, you learned that Allah refers to Salah If you were here, if you are the way of Allah, then you will be waiting for the one Salah when you are waiting for the Salah to enter the Prophet of the what is the matter of the law in the room? Why is it in the fire? Shall we put you with regard to those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives sins and Allah ta'ala wipes away the bad things? So, when the Abu Idraja and Allah raise the slave Daraja, so this is actually not so. Yes, no, sir. This is what I can explain to you. So, this is the start of the good idea. To fulfill, to perfect you, to do at the places that is generally needed. People that live behind the earth, for example, and how to the dreams that exist under the under the eyes, right? The under the chin, while the part of the earth it is a small thing, right? Includes the joy of the community. You see? It's about to protect you with the environment. But that is something that takes extra effort to It's not something that you can only do, but you can find it to be longer. What can you put on in the sense? You can do much to do with it. You can have a salad to have a salad. And you wait for the one salad after you've completed the salad. But that is the river, that is the river, that is the river. Such is the sacrifices and the sign of sacrifices and the So in this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that a person who has completed the salah because he is not his attention related to the next one. He's waiting eagerly for the next one to be taken. Now when a person is in that state, and that is your condition, that you are already now waiting for the next salah to come, and your mind is awaiting, and even though you busy with work, you're engaging, you're working, and you're doing the same amount of shopping, and you're going to get stuff in the needs of the child, but your mind is preoccupied with the next salah. Then they say, what is the after? Prophet says, a slave remains in salah as long as the salah is keeping. So, in the first matter of an example, he's not in the mashallah. And now he said, you know, I'm in salat, I don't know. The person is going to be in the very end of it. I'm going to do a much of this much. Well, I don't know how much of this much. Well, as long as he's eating, 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 he's eating. As long as you are waiting for the salah, you give it a good one. The Ummah is a sign of killer in time, a lack of knowledge, a lack of living in our spirits. It will be low of people who are wanting to be, wanting to see the speed of the world. As for the language, 
until the waqt of the salah is out or if he makes it that part of the salah is in and part of it is out it is a uh, it is a sin this is what adhan wal iqamatu min shahair salat tataakkadu al muhafazatu alayhima wa fihima fardu lil shaytan the holy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a nudia adbar shaytan the adhan and the iqama is from the signs of salah is from the signs that signifies the arrival and the coming of the salah the entrance of the work and it is important for the person to observe him even if you are alone even if you are alone make it fun if you uh, if you uh, if you're in a place with the adhan where you, you have not heard the adhan make the adhan in your home you and your family make the adhan before you make salah to jama'ah it's in the waqt make the adhan tell him instruct one of your children to make the adhan and then make your sunnah and then make the iqam وبهكذا not only have you fulfilled the sunnah of Rasulullah sallam, but you have also driven shaitan out of your home. Because uh, shaitan when he hears the adhan, khanas, he runs, he flees, he can't stand the call for, for adhan. That is one thing. And the other, the other, other reward is that a person who calls the adhan, every single creation of Allah that hears that adhan will be witness to him on the day of qiyamah to invite the people to salah. And therefore, Rasulullah says that Mamin Mu'addin, there is no Mu'addin that calls the Adhan except that on the day of Qiyamah, every creation of Allah that heard his Adhan as far as his voice reached will be witness to Allah on the day of Qiyamah. This man is a Mu'addin. This man, person made up. وَإِنَّ الْمُؤَذِّنِينَ لَأَطْوَلُ النَّاسِ أَحْنَاقَ الْيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ Those who call Adhan have the longest uh, nicks on the day of Qiyamah. Some scholars say that this is metaphor and some is a reality. It's a reality in that they will stand out above the rest. And others say it's a metaphor for how they will be given uh, precedence and superiority over everyone because they are the ones that invite the people. And because they invite the people, they will then therefore have a, a fadl over everyone on the day of Qiyam. Is the Mu'addin better or the Imam? The scholars describe Is it better to be a, a, an Imam or is it better to be a Mu'addin? And the other people said. And those who say that the, the, the Imam, is they say because Rasulullah sallam chose the Imam, then he didn't was the Mu'adid. So they say Imam from that perspective is better. So then the first, the first group make Radda and they respond to them. They say, yes, Rasulullah made Adhan, made Imam because there was no one else to lead besides him. But had it been that they were better than him, and there is no one better than him, then you would have made Adhan to them. Then uh, uh, volunteer or request if you can have it on it because that is one that you will see the benefits and the result of it on the day of Qiyam. And everyone that comes on account of your invitation, the one who invites to good is like the one who is doing it himself, engaging in it. So if you inviting to salah and saying, Hey, ya salah, hey, ya salah. من المحافظة على الصلاة والإقامة لها of the signs that observing salah and establishing it is حسن الخشوع فيها that the person should have خشوع within his salah that the person should have خشوع within his salah and Allah says قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون Successful are the believers, those who are qashi'ah, they are what? They are 
harsh way. They are sincere, they are present with Allah within their salah. Uh, if one takes the, 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 the unspoken word here is, how can a believer be successful if he makes his salah without presence? How can you expect to be a believer who is successful if your salah is done and there is no presence of heart in his salah? And if he says, Al-Hasan al-Basri, Kullu salatin la yahdur fiha al-qal fahiyya ila al-hukubati asra. Every person who makes salah and his heart is not present within it, it is, more, it is more easier or it is more likely that a person could be, should be punished for that than being rewarded for it. Because he hasn't, he's not present with Allah. What is, what is he? What has he actually performed? It's just suwa. It's just actions. But there's no ruh in it. As we spoke about, we mentioned yesterday, the first one to give to the king, a wasifa, a servant, or maid. And the maid is not. Testing. وإن المصلي قد يصلي الصلاة فلا يكتب له منها سدسها ولا عشرها. A person would make salah and then the only reward that he gets is not even one sixth of the salah, one tenth of the salah, because he wasn't even present for one tenth of the salah. He was absent from the beginning till the end. Even one of the uh, one of the uh, ulama, uh, he was mentioning, it may have been Mawlana Yusuf Patel, where he mentioned, he said that some people in his salah, they are like uh, a person on the aircraft. They're like a person in the aircraft. The aircraft takes off and he falls asleep. And he's flying and he's sleeping through the whole flight. Eventually when they say, we are now approaching Cape Town International, and then he wakes up and says, please tie your seat down. <laughs> Allah, then they land, and then he wakes up. Otherwise, he's sleeping. He's, he's not present. His heart is far away from everything, uh, from Allah Ta'ala, and he's busy with everything other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He says, Ahani. He says, يُكْتَبُ لَهَا مِنْهَا الْقَدْرِ So Allah only gives for him the reward that he was present with Allah in it, was, and that he's, uh, he was sincere with Allah in it. And that may be more and that may be less according to the ghafla, the person's state of heedlessness. As for the person who's hard in his salah, tuktab lahu salatuhu kulluha. The one who's present for the entire salah, his entire salah is, they say a sign of a salih person is that he must be able to make two rakas without the duration of two rakas. His heart does not once get distracted. A sign of a salih person is that at least you must be able to perform at least two rakas without his heart being distracted. If his heart is distracted within two rakas, then he still has work to do. And the more he makes mujahada, you must constantly bring your heart back. You must bring your heart back. Bring your heart back. And the more you bring your heart back all the time, so you, if you're astray and you realize you, you bring your heart back against the salah. If you, if you go away and you lose presence, you bring your heart back again. Once you constantly do this, one after the other, after the other, then your heart becomes accustomed to be present. And then you become less distracted. And you become less heedless. And it becomes less and less and less. Until you reach a point where it is impossible for you to be distracted even if you want to. You can't. And if all, they say one, some of this while they say, what is what does your nafs tell you during salah? So he says, وَهَلْ شَيْءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَنْ أَحَدِّثْ هَذِهِ بِهَا نَفْسِ Is there anything more beloved to me than Allah that my heart must tell me, speak to me about other than Allah? There's nothing. And another person said, بِمَا تُحَدِّثُكَ نَفْسُ He says, لَأَنْ أُقَطْعَ قِطْعَةً قِطْعَةً For me to be chopped up and diced into cubes is more beloved to me than my heart in the statue of Islam. These meanings, these meanings are reality. And these meanings are emanated from hearts who uh, initially wasn't like that. They never, they never, they weren't born like that. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has from those khawas of Islam 
they were they were they were they were born in a state of qurb they were born like uh, habib um, uh, muhammad bin zayd al khumay nazil al madina the the the, the uh, mufti of madina the greatest one of the greatest fuqaha that uh, of this uh, century and one of the most senior shafi'i fuqaha is very very uh, senior now he's uh, not frail but he's very senior and uh, very difficult to get access to him these days because of the amount of restrictions by the government that's imposed upon him so he's constantly being watched constantly being watched so in order to meet him you can't go to his house anymore these days so you have to meet him in a public place like in a masjid and you can't speak too long to him because he's constantly watching him so uh he's he's chosen that he wants to stay in Medina, he wants to die in Medina. Else, if he were to travel, then so much people would, would be able to meet him and benefit from him. But he gave preference to being close to Rasulullah his grandfather. And he uh, he followed the madhab um, and the, uh, the statement of Imam Malik when they told when they told Imam Malik that um, uh, Abu Jahfar al Mansur, when he told him, um, why don't you take the muwatta? And then if we send you to the different countries so you can teach the people the Muwatta. So it is as for teaching the people the Muwatta, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu traveled throughout the world. And all of them when they traveled, they gave the knowledge that they learned from Rasulullah sallallahu And for me now to impose what I learned and what reached me of Rasulullah is going to be uh, it's going to be an injustice to the world. Because I can't enforce my opinions and what I've learned and what has reached me uh, upon the rest of the world. Because the Sahaba went throughout the world and all of them had ilm, all of them had knowledge. As for you wanting to send me out of Medina, and this was a Khalifa at the time, in order to go and teach the people outside, the Prophet says, well, Medina to lahum, law kanu And Medina is better for them if only they knew. وَمَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ أَنْ يَمُوتَ بِالْمَدِينَةِ فَلْيَفْحَلْ and he who is able to die in Medina, let him do so. Allahumma ja'alna mawtan bil Medina, wa let us die in Medina. And the dying in Medina is not... ...not <coughs> to look to the Sahib al-Maqam, the Sahib al-Habra, uh, the, the uh, mayor of Medina. And by mayor of them, the politicians. The politicians are given the dua, the batin, the realities, of the affairs of Medina is the Sahib al Medina, Sahib al Qubba, alayhi salatu was salam. And only once your heart is attached to him and you have extreme yearning to be close to him, then such will be your state that you could, you, you could end up in Medina. And in ending up in Medina doesn't mean that you will necessarily die in Medina. Because there are many people that die in Medina by coincidence. But Medina, the Prophet says, وَإِنَّ الْمَدِينَةَ لَتَنْفِي خُبُثَهَا كَمَا يُنْفِي الْكِيرُ صَدَعَ الْحَجِيمِ That Medina expels the fault and its dirt as how the, uh, the acid removes the fault of the iron in the metal. So as corrosiveness is removed from the metal by applying detergent, so Medina cleanses and purifies the fault from it. And then uh, this hadith never, never made sense. Um, or at least one could find difficult to understand it. And then in 2010, um, when, when, uh, when we went for Hajj, and then I met a person by the name of Sayyid Asim in Medina. And he said, Asim took me on some, some, some uh, tour to the Baqi al Gharfa, the Jannah al Baqi, as we know it. And um, so he was explaining to me that the from Maqabir and so on. And, uh, and then he explained to me, and then he narrated my story and told me that one of the nights, there was a very, very inspired person in that room. And he, that was like many, many years ago when you could still go and visit the Baqir al Gharqat at night. And it used to be open now, it's closed, you can't visit, and it's only certain hours you can do the visiting. But at that time, the night, the maqab, the maqabar used to be open and you could go and visit any time. And there was no restriction in standing at a certain qabr or you can't stand here, you must just walk and you can't make du'as, bid'ah, those 
those stories and those stuff was was weren't even prevalent at that time, right? So you could go anywhere, you could stand, you could make dua, supplicate to Allah in front of the Prophet of the Sahaba. So he says in this one Salih person, this Wali of Allah Ta'ala, when he was in, in the Maqbara, and then he saw in a far distance a man that uh, he couldn't see his shape. I just looked like a person that was carrying out bodies out of out of Baqi al Ghafur and he was taking it out. And he was bringing bodies from outside of Medina, outside of the Baqi al Ghafur, bringing it into the Maqbara and bringing it in. And uh, then later on, when Habib Muhammad Sakhaf was here, us, and then uh, in his, his last visit, so he narrated to us his story. And then he said that there was this one man in Turkey, and this is documented, and this, I've heard the story at least maybe 10 times, if not more. That, uh, and I've heard it maybe from five, six different sources at least, um, of which at least four of them are scholars, right? and international and local scholars. So they say that there was this person that um, he, was in, he was from Turkey, and he wrote the entire Quran with his hand. He wrote the Quran with his hand. And then he said that, I hope that, he told his, his, son, his children that the day you bury me, I want you to bury me with my Quran. I put the Quran on my chest, and then you wrap me with the Quran that I wrote on my chest. Put it on my chest. I hope that this Quran that I wrote will be in position. So they did that, and he was buried in Turkey. And then the sons, a few years later, they came and they made Hajj. They came for Hajj. When they came for Hajj, so the, uh, they went to the Ma'arab al-Qur'an, the Qur'an exhibition. So this was now recent when the Qur'an exhibition was uh, opened up. And they went and they saw the different Qur'an and they saw this Qur'an. And they knew this Qur'an because of the handwriting of their father. They said, Franco, this is that is my daddy's Qur'an. Yes, this is daddy's Qur'an. Called the manager of the exhibition. And they asked him, who's the, who's the, the owner of this Qur'an? So, so the manager of the exhibition, he told him, you know, this Qur'an actually has a story. This Qur'an, when we were busy digging up the grave, in order to put other bodies there, we found a body that was completely intact. It has not been consumed at all by the earth. And this Qur'an was on the chest of the person, and we don't know what his name is, we don't know who he is, we don't know who the Qur'an belongs, we just know that this was the of the person there. So we took it and put it in the museum. He was buried in Turkey. But they took the Quran out in Medina. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, in this, uh, make sure you realize that beyond the world of the physicality that we see, these realities that is happening, these things that are happening which we are unaware of, these haqqaiq, these realities, Allah makes it known and apparent to the people of Qulub that possesses light. If Allah gives you insight, and Allah makes these realities of the world apparent to you. In the same way, a person who takes a, a, a telescope and he looks and he looks at he looks at a certain object and he says, I see what you don't see with your naked eye. Mm. I see the germ. I see the, don't touch the surface. We first clean it. That when it was the COVID time, so people were having this, this scanners and all they say that this is contaminated, so you must first sanitize this. These are people that created gadgets. The creative gadgets to see that is a naked eye cannot see. Or telescope. They can see from here, they see what, what do they see? The stars and the galaxy and stuff. The people with hearts. When Allah opened up for them the veils, then they see what the person with the telescope cannot see. That which, what they see with the telescope is still part of the apparent world. It's still part of that which is seen. Allah, Allah removes veils and that which no gadget. No uh, instrument, no sophisticated telescope, and whatever you want it can be, can, can see. Allah that is one of those things. Yeah. 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 Means are means that it only opens up to the person whose heart 
is correct. And the person involved cannot be correct if he is still, uh, if he's still uh, uh, attached and if he's to the world of means and the world of physicalities, the world of deception and the world of temptation. It cannot be because he's, he has so many veils around his heart that his heart cannot witness those realities. His heart cannot see it. So you need to rid you from Ahya, from everything besides Allah. And you need to approach Allah through the best person, al muhtar the chosen one. And Allah Ta'ala opens up for you the nur al-anwar. And Allah Ta'ala opens up for you that ma la tudrikuhu al-absar, that which your eyes cannot see. But ma tudrikuhu al-uyul, al-qalbiyya, ma tudrikuhu al-basira, that which the inner side sees. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala open up our hearts. And these days are days where in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala removes veils from people's hearts. Allah removes veils. Allah removes veils. Allah removes veils. And then the person realizes that yes, I have so much knowledge. I, I had so much. You know, I thought this, I thought that. But it is all these veils that were covered that, that made him think that he knows. But then Allah Ta'ala removed the veils. And Allah removed it and is able to see and the light penetrated his heart. He realizes what I knew in the reality. Okay. So he said, Ah, Bismillah, Bismillah. <laughs> No one is perfect in terms of his physicality, and um, as a result of that, as a result of that, many many are not uh, in the same way you have work to do with your with your, uh, with your body. The person, the person also has work to do with his his. He needs to build his room. So as you. Uh, you have physical sustenance. So they gave me now a cup of coffee. And the intention behind giving me this cup of coffee is to keep me awake. Right? So I don't fall asleep while I'm teaching. Also that uh, I don't talk you and Islam. Right? <laughs> so whatever you are, this, so this is physical sustenance. The, the food we eat, the porridge you eat, and the milk you had, you drank from your mother, or the cereals, or the different uh, nans that you that the that the, ch that the child drank, these are physical sustenances. It assists with the nurturing of the physical body. The soul and the spirit also has nurturing. It also has food, and it also has sustenance. And the sustenance of the soul is the are these gatherings. It is salah, it is Quran, it is fasting. All acts of ibadah are sustenance for the for the spiritual body. The spiritual body grows as how the physical body grows. And therefore, a person who is balanced is as his physical body grows, his spiritual body grows with him. That's a person who is at least yeah, is balanced. A person who is imbalanced is a person who is a grown-up man, but he still has the spirituality of a child. It's not mukallaf yet. A person who has excelled is the one who he may be at a tender young age, but he already has a spirituality of someone who's 60, 70 years old. Now, and a person who is elected by Allah, chosen by Allah, is a child who is born, and he's already born with the spirit of an 80-year-old. And that is, that is ikhtiyar, that is choice from Allah. So Habib Zain bin Sumayt, when you're speaking about wilaya, um, he says, so Al Habib Zain bin Sumayt is this person that I was speaking about, the Shafi'i Taqiyah from Medina. 
When you spoke at Vilaya, so you see some people, they, uh, it takes them years, 40, 50 years to attain a station of Vilaya. And other people, it takes them a few years and they attain the station of Wilayat. And others, it takes them a few months. And others, it takes them a few weeks. And others, it takes them a few days. And others, just one hour is enough for them to attain the station of Wilayat. And then he says, some are born with Wilayat. And then he says, and that's like you, Habib Omar. He says, <laughs> referring to Habib Omar. He says, Habib was sitting together. People that are born with, with the station of wilayat. May Allah grant us wilayat, Ya Rabbi. Fajtahid rahimakallahu fil khushu'i wal huduri fi salat. Wa tadabbar ma taqra'uhu min kalami rabbika fi salatik. Wa la ta'ajal idha qara'at fa innahu la tadabbar ma'al ajala. He says, uh, uh, exert yourself. May Allah have mercy upon you. To be present with Allah. And to be sincere. And ponder about what you read in your salah. Don't hasten. And you can't, you cannot ponder in salah if you are rushing through it. If you make ruku and you make sujood, fatma in, let your limbs be contented. Don't, la tanqur, tanqur is the naqr dik is when the, when the, when the chicken um, eh, picks. Don't pick in your salah the way the, the, the hen, the hen picks. No? Pick, pick, pick. Fala tasihu salatuk. Salah is not, it's not uh, valid. لِأَنَّ الطُّمَأْنِينَ فِي الرُّكُوعِ وَالْإِعْتِدَالِ So the Tumaknina is one of the arkan of Salah. How much arkan of Salah is there? 13 arkan. For those who include, who say Tumaknina is part of the Rukun. So they say, uh, Rukur was Tumaknina. So if they add Tumaknina as part of the Rukur, then it's 13. And if they say it's a separate Rukun, then it is 17. And those who say it's 14, what do they say? Those who say it's 14, they say Tuma'nina in itself is a rukun. So you don't have to repeat it after everything. So you say ruku' and then Tuma'nina, repose, and then uh, sujood, and then repose, and then jal. So those four reposes, right, is regarded as one. Because Tuma'nina in itself reposes is a rukun. And those who say, no, it's a separate one, they add another four, and that brings it to 17. And those who say no, the repose is part of the rukun because the rukun is not valid without it. They, they say that the arkan of salah are, are 13. The reason why those who say 17 is 17, um, because they say when the hadith of the Prophet, when he explains to the person how to make salah, he says, Then you make ruku, then he says, Then you make sujood, there is a rukun, until you have reached the repose. That's a separate rukun. That's why they, they added it to as a as a separate rukun. Uh, and what is the miqdar of tumanina? What is the uh, duration of the repose? Miqdar tasbih. There's the duration of the tasbih. But what is the condition? Is that your lung must have at least settled within the position. So if you're coming up, right? Or let's say you're going down to ruku. As you're going down to ruku, Allahu Akbar. There was no repose because your, your body was still moving, even if you moved lower than the actual rukun. So, if your rukun is at this position and you went down beyond that, but your body never remained still, so you went and as you went, you came up again. There was no pause, biqdar, with the duration of a tasbih, then you didn't fulfill the, the condition of tumanina. No. Bow down and prostrate yourself in composure. Do not pick as chickens do. Make your way will not be valid. Composure during bowing down, standing up afterwards, during the two prostrations, and kneeling down in between is necessary. You cannot be dispensed with, whether in obligatory or sporadic prayer. And without it, the prayer is invalid. He who neither performs his bowing down and prostrations to completion, nor is sufficiently humble, is the one who steals from the prayer. Also 
Allah preserve you as how you have preserved it. When it is not performed properly, it comes out black and dark. It says, May Allah neglect you as how you have neglected me. Then it is wrapped up just as a worn out garment is wrapped up. Then his face is struck with it. But it says that the prayer is but poverty, submission, and humility. Once when he noticed a man playing with his beard as he prayed, Prophet said, that this one's heart been humbled, his limb could also have been humbled. The fullness of the body is part of the heart's humility. No prayer is complete without it. Our ancestors, and Allah will please with him, is right. He who is aware of who is standing on his right, who is left during prayer, is not humble. Some of our ancestors were so humble during the prayers that birds alighted on the moon. So they stood and frustrated themselves for so long that the birds took them to a wall or some other inanimate object. The fellow once fell in a great mosque out in the marketplace. The people were terrified, except for one man praying in the mosque, who was so absorbed in his prayer that he felt nothing at all. Another used to tell his family, once I commence praying, do what you want, meaning raise your voices and make noises as you will, I shall not hear you. They sometimes beat the drums next to him without him hearing you. Once, as he was in frustration, the house of Ali, Ali ibn al Hussein, who was with him both, mm-hmm. started to burn. People shouted, Beware of the fire, beware of the fire, O son of the Messenger of Allah. But he did not raise his head. When his prayer was over, they asked him why he did so. He replied, I was distracted from it by the fire of the year of Allah. The man was once asked, Do you experience in your prayer those same worldly thoughts that he does? He said, I would rather be run through by tears than experience that. Mm-hmm. Another was asked, Do you talk to yourself with a prayer? He said, Is there anything more beloved to me than the salah? And I talk to myself about it. A thief once stole a rabbi in a fatum there while he was praying. Those who saw this began to invoke Allah against him. The rabbi said, I saw him when he untied us. They asked him, why then did you not pursue him and defeat him? He replied, My prayer was dearer to me than the man, and I now declare that I'm relinquished to I, I am relinquishing the man to him. A companion of a soul was once praying in his garden when he was distracted by birds flying from one tree to another. When he realized he had been distracted, he was so aggrieved that he gave the whole garden away for the same. I say, This is all because our virtuous ancestors. Will be pleased with him. Knew how great the importance of the prayer is and how essential it is to religion. It is reached us that Allah, exalted as He, has divided the various parts of the prayer among 40,000 ranks of angels, each rank made of 70,000 angels. Ten ranks are ever standing up, never bowing down. Ten bowing down, never prostrating. Ten in prostration, never rising up. And ten sitting down, never standing up. All this he joined into two rakah, that his believing servant is given to pray. To see how immense his grace and favor are upon his believing servants. The Prophet says, Imagine that the river flows near a man's doorstep and he prays in it five times a day. Do you think any dirt will remain on him? Answer, no dirt will remain on him. This is the likeness of the five trees with which Allah erases him. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one prayer after another are expiations for what takes place between you, so long as major sins are avoided. Whenever it is time to pray, pray, Bakr as Allah be pleased with him to say, Arise and put out this fire of yours which we have to you. By fire he meant his sins. Now, by putting down, putting it out he meant uh, what salah. For it expiates and raises bad deeds. Allah exalted as he says, establish the prayer at both ends of the day, that is, in part of the night, for good works to away with sin. This is a reminder for those who remember. This verse was revealed after a man who was guilty of one of those things, which may take place with a woman, thought of intercourse, came to the Prophet, requesting to submit to this, that free punishment. But the Prophet Allah and gave him no answer. So after the ritual prayer was called for, and they had prayed. He asked him and recited his verse to him. The man asked, Is this for me in particular? 
for the people in general. He said, for the people in general. I say, this is evidence that minor sins are expiated by faith as well as by other good works. However, to refrain from them is better and safer. Also, no statutory punishment is prescribed for anything short of interview, such as kissing and touching. But the man thought there was, and he wished to be thus purified. So he speaks about some of the uh, examples of the Salihin when they make Salah. And he says, before he does so, he mentions a hadith, which is a very beautiful hadith. And it is, an, it is a hadith that should encourage us to better our Salah. And it uh, should uh, stir within us a fear for what the state and the condition of our Salah is. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that the one who makes salah and he perfects his salah and he's present with Allah in his salah, the salah leaves him and it is white and shining and bright. And the salah as it leaves, it goes up to the sama, it says, Hafidhakallah, may Allah preserve you as how you have preserved me. And when he performs salah and he is not present with Allah in it and he just wants to get done with it and he's just doing the actions and there's no ruh in it, there's no substance of salah, there's no context to the salah, there's no reality to salah, then the salah leaves him where he is so muslima. It is dark and it is black. And it is in, in the salah it says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ruin you as how you have ruined me. And then it is taken, the salah is taken, and then it is it is wrapped as how a old or a dirty rag is wrapped and then it gets thrown back into the face of the person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that not be the condition of our salah. Ameen. And a person was playing with his beard one day in his salah. He was playing with his beard. As he was playing with his beard in his salah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لو خشع قلب هذا لخشع الجوارح. If this person's heart was present and sincere and humble, then his limbs would have been present and humble. But because his limb, his heart is not present, so his limbs are finding other things to, to do. And so he says, some of the salihin, the salaf, the pious predecessors used to say, the one who knows who's on his right and his left in salah, that person not a khashir. If you know who's making salah on your right, that is, that's not if you are start, starting your salah. So if you're starting and you know, you see before you start salah, you see who's on you. But you don't, you never saw. And now you pick up your salah. And while you're picking up your salah, you now know who's now on your side. You come to know during your salah, that's not a khasha. A khasha, a person is within his salah, he doesn't know what is happening around. To such an extent that they used to stand, uh, they used to stand like a pillar used to stand, like a pillar. And the birds used to sit on their head thinking that this is a pillar. That's how still they used to be in your salah. And uh, a uh, istiwana, one of the pillars in the masjid in Basra fell. And when it fell down, it came crashing on the floor. The entire market outside the masjid, the people started, they, they, they got the shock. What's happening? And they all ran into the masjid. When they ran into the masjid, they saw that they were still a man making salah. Everyone was ran out. And there was one man who was still making salah. And he was making was, yeah. And eventually, he was done making salah. He was looking at everybody. What's, what's happening? He said, didn't you hear what happened now? This whole pillar here on the side of the message came collapsing down. He said, ma sha didn't feel it. The shit that is the in salah. That is how he was consumed in, in his salah. Al, uh, al Imam uh, Ali bin Hussein. Ali Zayn al-Abidin, the great-grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the famous narration that he was in salah and he was making sujood. And he was in sujood, then the, the, uh, uh, the, his house, his house started burning. And he was in sujood. And then the people from outside started running to put out the fire. And they're shouting, they tell him, Ya Nabi Ta Rasulullah, come out. Ya Nabi Ta Rasulullah, come out. And he is not responding at all. And he's just in salah. Eventually, when he came from sujood, and he makes his istilah, salam alaykum wa rahmatullah. He hears him, Ya Abna bin Tarasul. Oh, this is happening here. So, they, so he comes out and he leaves the house, and they tell him, We're calling out and we're shouting, Ya Masamir. 
Did you not hear us? I say, yeah. So I say, what, what, what happened? She says, Al-Hatni an nar nar al-Ukhra. This fire, I got distracted from this fire by the fire of the Akhirah. The time for me. The smell. What about the smell? Don't you, isn't, isn't the smoke the fire? Don't you suffocate? The senses all becomes numb with the inshallah. You know, when, you, you know what it means? becomes numb. One of the habayl, uh, he was very sensitive to, to noise. And so when he, uh, when he, uh, when he should come into his house, when he should tell us, yeah, what's so, what's so hard in the box, but you have to ask me, well, I can't handle it. And then he should tell them, if you want to make a noise, wait till I make salah. And once I make salah, then you shout like you want to. If you want to take and hit the tooth, the drum or so, hit the drum or so, I want to. And then you should enter into salah. Why is he in the salah? <laughs> the children run up and down and they shout and no huwa ghayru, ghayru, uh, uh, la yashur shay. La yashur shay. He doesn't feel anything of, of, uh, of what's happening. Subhana, subhana, subhana. Urwa ibn Zubair. Urwa ibn Zubair. Uh, the, the, he had gangrene in his leg. He had akala. Gangrene in his leg. And then they told him we need to, we need to chop off your leg. So uh, he's so he said, okay. So that is the case. We need to. Okay. So we need to give you something just to to uh, numb the pain. But it's going to maybe make you makes you a bit drowsy. But it's going to numb the pain. This is hasha and atahata shi and yulhini anillah. I will never take anything that will distract me from Allah. So said, but how are you going to manage the pain? He says, I got the I got the uh, has an answer for you. I have a solution for you. I'm going to make salah. And when I make salah, you do what you want to do. And when I'm uh, and when I'm done with salah, you should be done with it, with the operation. Keep, keep. Let's have a salah. Allah Akbar. Sitting. And they stop. Stop taking it. He's laying and stitching. And when he's done, when he was, he, without any stitching, without uh, proofings, and without painkillers, no, nothing. Right? And you just leave. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Khalas, come on, come on. Khalas. I said, Khalas. Everything is done, operation done. Then he said, he looked at his leg, he said, Alhamdulillah. Allahumma inna, inna ka qad a'taytani qadami. Oh Allah, you gave me two legs. You took one and you left one. I thank you for that which you have left behind. And I'm grateful to you for that which you have taken on. As that happens, someone comes and I tell him, Ya Urwa, Ya Urwa. One of your sons just had two sons. One of your sons just fell off the, 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 the roof of the house and he died. Comes in, son is running out. And looks at his other son and says, Ya Rabbana Alaka Alham. Oh Allah, all praises to you. You gave me two sons. Took away one and you left one. I'm grateful for what you have taken away. And I thank you for that which you have, which you have left with me. But this is the, the, the state of hudur with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The state of presence with Allah is that uh, nothing, nothing distracts him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus, versus a person who the slightest noise, the slightest knock, the slightest uh, crickle in the ceiling. Huh? Yes. The, genie. <laughs> the slightest thing, maybe a cockroach here just on the floor. <laughs> and he runs away, breaks his salah maybe. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, he says, um, Rabi ibn Khaytham, someone came and he stole his horse. While he was making salah, and people started um, praying against him. Rabi, uh, when he was done salah, so uh, he told him, he says, yeah, I saw you, the horse in front of me, and I saw him untying the horse, and he took it away. So they said, so why didn't you break your salah? And he says, break my salah. The voice is not more beloved to me than my salah. The voice is not And seeing that he took it, uh, if you see him, tell him that uh, I've given the horse to him. It's a gift from me to him. So anything that is to distract him from, from salah, the likes of one of the sahaba, he says, he had, a, he had a garden and he was making salah in his garden and the birds was flying from one tree to the other. And as they're flying, 
are the flies. And just that moment got distracted by the birds that were flying. Beautiful birds making a noise, flying from one tree to the other, nice sounds and oh, very relaxing. And he got distracted by that from the salah. When he made when he when he made the sila, he says, This garden, these birds distract me from Allah. He gave the entire garden away for a second. Gave it to a salah. The Prophet when he made salah, he made salah on a, on a carpet. And this carpet had had uh, sign had had marks on it. And then after the Prophet made salah, she take this carpet and give it away. Give it away as a gift. So they said, why am so it's because some of this patterns here distracted me from my salah. You know, I don't need to have distracted me from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the uh, the presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in salah is not just a, it's not, uh, it's not just a uh, matter of, you know, your heart, your, your body must, must stand still and it's a matter of the heart. Or you must, your eyes must be closed or your head must be down. In fact, in the hour of the khattab, one person is making salah and looking down like this. And his head was lowered. So he said, Ya sahib al raqaba Ya sahib al raqaba Oh, the person with a with a neck with a lowered head, as salah leisa biwabah rakaba. Salah is not by lowering your neck. Oh, and I said khushua is not by lowering your neck. Khushua is the presence of the heart. And now you say like this, oh, that now the presence of Allah, khushua is in the heart. Don't think that you by pulling your face a certain way or lowering your head a certain way or that, that is that you now khashia. No. Khushu'ah comes from, comes from the heart. May Allah Ta'ala grant us khushu'ah, Ya Rabbi. That is very difficult. And shaitan doesn't leave you. Shaitan doesn't leave you. So he, uh, when he sees you, make attention to, to, to be present with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala at the beginning stages, and he reminds you of the most weirdest things that you long time forgot about. Long forgot about. A person comes to Abu Hanifa and says, Ya yeah, Imam, I lost. I lost my money, a bag, my life savings all in there, all my gold coins was in there. So he says, uh, you know, Bahanifa, he says, look, I, this is not a fiqh question, and I am a faqih, and I can't give you hukum for this. What I can tell you is, go home now, go make salah until fajr. Make salah until fajr, and then hopefully, inshallah, you'll find it. So he goes home and he makes salah. Quarter of the night passes by, he remembers where he put his bag. Break his salah. <laughs> Break his salah and he go and get it. They come to Abu Hanifa the next day and say, Oh, I found it. I found the money. He says, Do you at least complete the salah? He says, No, no, no. I was afraid I'm going to forget again. <laughs> so Abu you know, Hanifa told him, Halla, malta salata. You should have completed the salah to thank Allah that He allowed you to find you. I see how Shaitan is. Shaitan don't leave you. He, uh, he, he makes you remember the, the most obvious things within your salah. And once you Become your heart, saying, oh, I'm going to be connected. And he makes you realize more important things and more important things and more important things up to the point where he even tells you, remember, you wanted to, you wanted to go drop a food parcel to Auntie Halima. But this was a good thing. A food parcel, Sadaqah for Auntie Halima, she's a widow. You're supposed to go drop that food parcel there. Eh? And then from there, Takes you from the food parcel to the car, you must change the oil. Don't forget, you must go put in petrol. You see how he uses the khayr and then it distracts you. Just to, as the, as the, just as a pawn, khayr is just there as a, <laughs> and then it takes you from there to the dunya. And now he dangles around with you like the old time until you sit in, uh, you sit in your tashahud and they say, Tong, we have reached Cape Town. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Then the person becomes present. May Allah Ta'ala grant us the presence of the heart. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Rahim Rahim, Ya Rahim Rahim. Allahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sahbihi.
So هذا اللي إذا اللي إنه أحمد بن حسن العطاس يسي ماشي بوك تذكير الناس. أسوأ سما هذا بوك تذكير الناس. أسوأ هذا ما بوك تينا إذا ما أسوأ إنه بوك تذكير. So he in this book تذكير الناس is is the the from the كلام of the حبيب أحمد بن حسن العطاس. The حبيب أحمد بن حسن العطاس was a contemporary of the of al Sheikh Muhammad Shatta of of Nazil Makkah. The the the, the Shafi scholar of Makkah is also contemporary of the father, the grandfather of Sayyid Muhammad Ali al Maliki, Sayyid Abbas al Maliki. Um, he was also contemporary of Sheikh Ahmed Zaini Dahlan. They were contemporary. So uh, so he he uh, he says in his book that um, he mentions the story of Habib Abdullah bin Umar Abdullah bin uh, Umar bin Yahya bin Aqil. Uh, he says that he uh, when he used to make salah, he used to have istighraq fully, he used to be completely consumed in salah, completely, to a point that he loses his presence that he must make into rukua. So what he used to do is he used to be a student always behind him. He used to be a student behind him, probably not in salah. And the student is so, when he takes very long, the student says, rukua! <laughs> And when he's in sujood, it takes long. So you say, sujood, ihtidal, uh, or julus. Then he comes up and he says, sujood. And that's how he used to be, mustaghrib. Consumed in salah to a point that he forgets that his people are standing behind him. He forgets that people are standing behind him. And that is, subhanAllah, the amount of, imagine the amount of presence that you, that you feel with Allah, that you are not aware of anything around you. And just think, think about the example of that. Imam Ali Zain al Abidin, where the fire burns. Imagine you don't feel the heat, you don't smell the smoke, you don't hear people shouting, you don't hear the noise of the stuff breaking around you, nothing. You are just in salah. And it wouldn't be far fetched if that fire must burn, he probably wouldn't even feel it. Can you imagine that amount of istighra? Can you, can you imagine that? You know, you see sometimes a person watches, I will give you like a very silly example, but that is. That comes to my silly mind now. A person watches a horror movie. He watches a horror movie and he's biting his nails. When the movie's done, he says, Oh, mm-hmm. oh he's watching the rugby game between uh, All Blacks and uh, what's the other? Springboks. And it's the last few minutes. And he is biting his nails. Only when he's done, he realizes how sore his nails are. He didn't even realize that he was, was biting. We, what happened to the pain? Because he was consumed, that is worldly consumption. That is worldly distraction. What about the distractions of the Akhirah? A person that says, it is as if I can see Jannah in front of me. Uh, the, the companion with the Prophet ﷺ tells him, uh, Haritha, when he says, the Prophet says, كيف أصبحت يا Haritha? Oh Haritha, you know, how did you wake up? He says, أصبحت مؤمن الحق. I feel like I'm a true believer, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet says, everything has a sign. What's the sign of Iman? He says, Ya Rasulullah, it is as if I can see the Arsh of Allah. As you can see the Arsh of Allah. Imagine you see the Arsh of Allah, the throne of Allah. You, if you must see now, if Allah Ta'ala was allow you to see, uh, uh, what? Like the creation, say the Malaika. And the malaika in from the from the in the Samawa, not not by the arsh, like a first second Samawa, you see the malaika. Imagine what is your you this person sees the arsh. They only which instrument can show you the arsh. Any instrument that, that, that it doesn't matter how far and how uh, meticulous and how detailed and how fine and how complicated. That instrument is, you can't see beyond the first summer. Everything that people have discovered up until today, it is all in the first summer. They have not gone beyond the first summer. Ish, Moon, Mars, uh, Pluto, Zuhal Mushtara, Marikh, Marikh. I'm going to say the Arabic because I don't know all the English ones. <laughs> all of those Atarid, all of those uh, planets that you know, all of that is in the first summer. And the ones they've never, they've gone to the moon. The one, the sun, the sun, sun, first summer. 
all of that's in the first summer. The the galaxies, the Milky Way, first summer. No one has gone beyond the first summer. And the first summer, they say that we are one galaxy. They say there's right? millions of galaxies, like our galaxy. That's all in the first summer. So we haven't seen beyond our galaxy, let alone the galaxies that are next to our galaxies. And what is the Earth in relation to uh, the, the, our galaxy? It's like nothing. It's like, like, just a dot like that, so on a, on a whiteboard, dot like that, that's the Earth. What about the Earth next to the other galaxies? What about the Earth next to hundreds of galaxies and thousands of galaxies? They haven't discovered the amount of how many thousands of galaxies they are. What they know is they just they are just following assumptions, but by Allah they have not seen any of the other galaxies. They haven't seen it. No instrument has discovered it. That's only the first summer. What about the second? And Allah says that the first summer to the second is like a grain of sand in the desert. And the second to the third it's like a grain of sand in the desert. And the third to the fourth, and the fourth to the fourth, and the fourth to the sixth, and the sixth to the and the seventh summer to the harsh like a grain of sand in the desert. Haritha says, I can see the harsh of Allah. Or he says, it is as if I can see the harsh of Allah. What the, what eyesight does he have? What gadget does he have? What thing is in his eyes? What sockets does he have? What glasses does he have? Maybe some, some complicated or some sophisticated uh contact laser what does it have in it? what does it have does it have red beams or infrareds or what does it have that's all in the first summer he has a heart as a heart that sees beyond the summer one he's, he's as i can see the arch of allah is that all haritha is it? this is what he tells rasulullah if he was lying the prophet would have told him you are a liar he tells Rasulullah, وَكَأَنِّي It is as if I can see the people in Jannah enjoying Jannah. And it is as if I can see the people of Jahannam being punished in Jahannam. What does Rasulullah tell him? Rasulullah tells him, عَرَفْت You've attained Ma'rifah. You've reached that station of Ma'rifah. Just be consistent. So, uh, the, if we think it is far-fetched, no, not far. And may Allah grant us these types of ahwal states. So he says, uh, Abdullah bin Umar bin Yahya, they say he, used to, he was one of those people that he was mustaghrit, he was completely consumed in his salah, that he needed someone to remind him. The qiyam, ruku', sujood. Why? He didn't even know what the next ruku' is. No. His heart was connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma rabutna bika ya Rabb. Allah connect us to you and allow us to be constantly in contact, in connection with you and on the footsteps of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam in this dunya, ya Rabb, and in the barzakh, ya Rabb, and on the day of qiyamah, ya Rabb, and in jannah with him, ya Rabb al-alameen, ya Rabb al-alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad, wa alhamdulillah. Ayna sahib insha'ad.
Salah, Allah, 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 Allah,